RTM Klik Sekarang PM Anwar's visit to Pakistan secures 2.65 billion ringgit in trade deals. EU boosts humanitarian aid to Lebanon by 33 million dollars. Hello, good afternoon, and Salam Malaysia Madani watching World Today with me, Shuhaida Arifin. Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim said his visit to Pakistan proves the highest commitment among the top leaders of the two countries to improve relations covering various fields ranging from diplomatic to economy. Speaking to the Malaysian media at the end of his three-day state visit to Pakistan, Dato Sri Anwar said there's great potential in trade relations between the two countries that need to be pioneered involving several projects that will be worked on by both countries. According to him, there is a high level of seriousness among the leadership of the two countries to see bilateral relations between Malaysia and Pakistan grow by leaps and bounds after his visit to the South Asian country in various fields. The book will be launched. The perbincangan yang serius untuk meningkatkan kerjasama dua hal dalam semua bidang, bidang perdagangan dalam bidang teknologi pertanian termasuk uh, soal uh, daging soal um, uh, beras tetapi juga dalam soal uh, import kelapa sawit yang mereka janji untuk meningkat uh, jumlah import uh, soal Pakistan, according to the Prime Minister, has the potential to become a gateway for Malaysian companies that want to expand their markets in Central Asia and West Asia. At the same media conference, Investment, Trade and Industry Minister Tengku Datuk Seri Zafrul Abdul Aziz announced that the Prime Minister's three-day state visit to Pakistan has a secured potential trade deals worth 2.65 billion ringgit. Syarikat Pakistan telah memberi komitmen untuk meningkatkan uh, pengimportan uh, minyak sawit, uh, produk berasaskan kayu, baja, petrokimia dan juga oleokimia dari Malaysia. Dan suka, jika, suka cita juga dimaklumkan bahawa lawatan ini juga menghasilkan komitmen pelaburan yang berjumlah 100 juta ringgit. Ini di dalam sektor halal. He added that both countries will commence discussions next month on reviewing the Malaysia-Pakistan Closer Economic Partnership Agreement, MPCEPA. The MPCEPA has been in effect since January 2008 and the review is expected to conclude by 2026. After his working visit to Pakistan, the Prime Minister continued his official visit to Bangladesh at the invitation of Chief Advisor of the Interim Government, Dr. Muhammad Yunus. The Dhaka visit, according to High Commissioner of Malaysia to Bangladesh, Hasna Marhashim, symbolizes Malaysia's solidarity with the people of that country who are facing a challenging situation at this time. Ia adalah satu elemen penting sebagai sebuah sebagai uh, dua buah negara yang bersahabat uh, dan elemen itulah juga yang telah berlaku pada tahun 1972 di mana Malaysia membuktikan persahabatannya dengan merupakan negara Muslim pertama yang mengiktiraf uh, kemerdekaan Bangladesh dan pada kali ini juga Malaysia juga merupakan negara pertama yang membuat rawatan peringkat ketua kerajaan. The Prime Minister is scheduled to hold a bilateral meeting with Muhammad Yunus and pay a courtesy call on President Muhammad Shahabuddin before departing back to Kuala Lumpur. Meanwhile, Dato Sri Anwar has described the situation in West Asia at the moment as resembling a morgue following the absence of a diplomatic solution to the ongoing conflict and atrocities in several parts of the region. Masyarakat ini tak ada. Masyarakat ini sangat, sangat mana kalau ibaratnya sugul lah kita ya, kerana kita duduk mendesak supaya dihentikan serangan ke Gaza, diteruskan Gaza, diperluaskan ke Lubnan. Uh, mula dia agak sangat selatan, Filipin, eh, selatan Lubnan, sekarang terus ke Beirut. 
Lepas ini apa lagi? Malaysia, according to him, has been strongly condemning the attack and has demanded that Israel's violent attacks on the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the southern Lebanon and Beirut be stopped immediately. Commitment dengan negara Arab, dengan Islam, cuba bersama-sama bersatu. Dan semua kita lakukan tanggungjawab mereka masing-masing. Mungkin um, tidak sepenuhnya memuaskan tapi suatu langkah dan yang sudah tegas. Tapi ini ke, ke, kedegilan Israel ini kerana mungkin uh, mereka masih bergantung kepada dukungan mereka syarikat dan sekutu mereka. The situation in West Asia escalated when Iran launched 180 missile attack on Israel two days ago, which allowed the entire region to plunge into war. In a related development, the European Commission has announced a further $33 million in humanitarian aid will be sent to Lebanon as Israel's conflict with Hezbollah escalates. The boost follows the additional $33 million provided at the end of September, bringing this year's total amount to more than $114 million. The aid package aims to bolster humanitarian support in Lebanon through food, shelter, health care and other essential services. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen hopes the new funding will ensure civilians receive much-needed assistance during this very difficult time. The Commission will also continue to call for a ceasefire across the border with Lebanon and in Gaza, as well as for the release of all hostages. The conflict has extended into Lebanon, with Israel conducting deadly attacks across the country since 23rd September. Meanwhile, four Malaysians evacuated from Lebanon have safely arrived at Kuala Lumpur International Airport, KLIA, this morning, while another is scheduled to arrive later in the day. According to the Foreign Ministry, their departure from Beirut via a commercial aircraft was facilitated by the Malaysian Embassy in Beirut. The Ministry affirmed that efforts are vigorously being pursued to evacuate the remaining Malaysians and their family members, which stand at 16. Meantime, the Palestinian Health Ministry said at least 16 Palestinians were killed in an Israeli strike on the Tokum refugee camp in the occupied West Bank. A source from the Palestinian Security Service reported that the airstrikes represent the most intense violence in the occupied territory since 2000. Hamas condemned the airstrikes, which was described as very cruel. The Palestinian Ministry of Health has indicated that the death toll is likely to increase. North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un said his forces would use nuclear weapons without hesitation if Pyongyang's territory was attacked by the South and its ally, the United States. The remarks came after South Korea staged a military parade earlier this week, with its president Yoon suk yeol threatening the end of the North Korean regime if Pyongyang used nuclear weapons. KCNA reported Kim branded the South Korean leader a puppet and an abnormal man. Kim's statements also reference the South's alliance with the United States, which is its principal military partner. Tens of thousands of U.S. troops are stationed in South Korea. The South has no nukes of its own and is covered by the U.S. nuclear umbrella. On Tuesday, South Korea marked the annual Armed Forces Day with a military parade showcasing a ballistic missile capable of carrying a massive warhead that also featured a fly-past of a U.S. bomber. The newly appointed Secretary General of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, Mark Rutte, told President Volodymyr Zelensky that Ukraine security matters for NATO during his first visit to Kiev. Rutte also reiterated NATO's pledge that Ukraine would one day be a NATO member. But this is my first time here as NATO Secretary General. And it was important to me that I come to Ukraine at the start of my mandate to make crystal clear to you, to the people of Ukraine and to everyone watching, 
that NATO stands with Ukraine. Ruta voiced a strong support for Ukraine after taking over as NATO chief from Jens Stoltenberg. Ruta served as the Prime Minister of the Netherlands until earlier this year and was regarded as the role as an ally of Kiev, approving the transfer of Dutch F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. The tourism business in ASEAN countries is thriving again after being badly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, this shows the significance of regional cooperation in developing a sustainable tourism industry. Audi Mohamed Noor files the report. Tourism has become one of the main growth sectors in ASEAN. In 2022, the number of tourists reached 39 million and surged to 91 million in 2023. It is estimated that by 2024, the number of incoming tourist visits will return to pre-pandemic levels around 120 to 130 million people. Jadi, mungkin untuk ASEAN Summit ini, kita boleh mempromosikan sekali budaya-budaya tradisional orang-orang yang ada di negara kita ni kepelbagaian kita tu mungkin orang Cina dengan budayanya dan sebab itu saya lebih kalau kita ni di samping di samping kita panggil ASEAN Summit ni adalah sikit sebanyak uh, pertunjukan persembahan event-event yang berkaitan dengan budak dengan budaya Meanwhile, Deputy Tourism, Art and Culture Minister Cairo Fidaus Akbar Han said the ASEAN Summit 2025 should be utilised to its fullest potential. Dan ini adalah peluang untuk negara kita menghidangkan produk-produk terbaru dan bukan dari sudut pelancongan tapi juga dari sudut kebudayaan kita untuk kita memperkenalkan dengan lebih baik apakah sebenarnya keistimewaan seni budaya kita. Dan ASEAN pada tahun depan adalah satu platform yang cukup baik untuk kita meneruskan ataupun untuk kita mempersiapkan diri bagi Tahun Melaut Malaysia 2026. Ahead of Malaysian ASEAN Championship 2025, various initiatives are being explored to boost tourism across the region. Industry players must be proactive to leverage on this opportunity to create a more sustainable, inclusive and vibrant tourism sector that benefit all member states. Audi Momano, ASEAN. Diplomatic talks on Myanmar's civil war will be held in Jakarta ahead of a regional summit convening next week. A senior diplomat in Indonesia told AFP that the talks on Friday and Saturday will involve representatives from Indonesia, ASEAN, the European Union and the United Nations and members of anti-junta groups. The diplomat said Myanmar's ruling military was not expected to take part. The discussion in the bloody conflict ranging from Myanmar since a 2021 coup is set to take place just before the Association of Southeast Asian Nations gathers in Laos for an 6th to 11th October summit. ASEAN, of which Myanmar is a member, has led several diplomatic pushes to resolve the crisis but has made little progress. The latest diplomatic push comes as Myanmar's military reels from battlefield defeats to ethnic minority armed groups and pro-democracy People's Defense Forces PDFS, that rose up to oppose the military's coup. More than three million people have been displaced after more than three years of war, according to the United Nations. The World Bank has approved a new project totaling 56 million US dollars for upgrading roads in Laos, helping about 600,000 people access public services while making rural roads more resilient to climate change. According to the state news agency, the Laos Climate Resilient Road Connectivity Improvement Projects will support the Lao government to improve around 300 kilometres of district and rural roads in Kamuan, Saravan and Savanakhet provinces. 
The project is funded by the World Bank's International Development Association, IDA, which helps low-income countries build a better future through low-interest credits that can be repaid over a long period. This new project is designed to benefit farmers and women especially by giving them year-round connections to the services that they need to help their families and communities thrive. The project will also support an internship program for women university students and recent graduates, providing six months of paid training in transportation and construction at the Lao Ministry of Public Works and Transport. Indonesia's most active volcano, Mount Merapi, emitted 21 lava flows towards the southwest. According to the Geological Disaster Technology Research and Development Center, the lava flows were moving towards the Kalibebeng, reaching up to 1,500 meters. Monitoring data shows that magma supply is still ongoing, which could trigger hot clouds within the potential danger areas. The danger zones extend up to 7 kilometers in the south-southwest sector and 3 kilometers to the southeast of the volcano. In the event of an explosive eruption, volcanic material could reach up to 3 kilometers from the peak. The center urges the people to avoid activities in danger zones that may be affected by lava flows and hot clouds. Located in central Java and Yogyakarta, the 2,968-meter-tall volcano is currently at alert status. Thailand's Department of Land Transport has revealed that the operator of the school bus involved in a recent fatal accident at Vibhavadi Rangsit Road was found to have engaged in illegal vehicle modifications. The department had summoned the operator to bring all five buses under its control alongside with affiliated vehicles for inspection at the Lopuri Transport Office. However, the operator exhibited evasive behaviour and failed to comply promptly with the inspection order. Upon investigation, the GPS locations of the buses, the department discovered that all of the operators' buses were at a private repair facility in Nakhon Rachasima province. It was found that the buses were in the process of removing gas tanks that exceeded the specifications registered with the authorities. This behaviour suggests an attempt to conceal unauthorised vehicle modifications, particularly to the gas systems, which could pose significant safety risks. The Department of Land Transport has documented the incident for further legal action. Coming up, US confirms new H5 bird flu human cases. 76 minutes, tanpa henti. 76 minutes, non-stop. Transparent and concise. Paparan komprehensif, ringkas dan padat. Saksikan Kanta 744, 744 malam. Berita perdana 8 malam. Malaysia tonight, 8.30 p.m. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, confirmed two human cases of H5 bird flu in California, marking the first H5 human cases in the Golden State. According to CDC, the cases occurred in people with occupational exposure to infected dairy cows. At this time, there is no known link or contact between the first and the second confirmed cases in California, suggesting there are separate instances of animal-to-human spread of the virus. An investigation led by California is ongoing, and CDC continues to collaborate closely with public health officials in California and other states to control the spread of H5N1 from infected animals to humans. H5N1 bird flu was detected for the first time in cows this year in the United States. The virus is widespread in wild birds and has caused ongoing outbreaks among poultry in the country since 2022. 
Six migrants died after Mexican soldiers fired on a group of 33 migrants from countries including Egypt, Nepal, Cuba, India and Pakistan, traveling in a pickup truck that had tried to evade the military patrol. According to the Mexican Defense Ministry, the vehicle carrying the migrants was traveling at high speed and apparently attempting to flee. Four of the migrants died at the scene, while two of the 12 injured lost their lives at the hospital. The 17 migrants, who were unharmed, were handed over to the immigration authorities. The two soldiers who opened fire have been removed from their duties, pending an investigation. The incident took place on a highway near the town of Huixla, some of 40 kilometers from Tapachula, by the Guatemalan border. According to a police report, soldiers chased a truck after it failed to stop at an army checkpoint, firing gunshots to try to stop it. The driver turned off down a dirt road in an attempt to escape but lost control of the vehicle. Flooding hit Mexico's southern coast ahead of Tropical Depression 11E's arrival. The National Guard and Army were deployed to Juquitan near the Pacific coast, where homes were left underwater and residents evacuated to a public shelter. A resident told the Reuters they had evacuated their homes at dawn after a local river burst its banks. The U.S. National Hurricane Center, NHC, warned that more heavy rain will hit Mexico's southern coast as Tropical Depression 11E intensifies, raising concerns about potential flooding and mudslides in areas already drenched by recent storms. It is forecast to make landfall late on Thursday or early Friday in southern Mexico, with a tropical storm warning in effect throughout parts of the coast. Last week, Hurricane John dumped massive amounts of rain over some of the same areas, causing floods and mudslides, resulted at least 22 deaths. Next up in sports, late Maguire had a Gibbs Man United draw in six goals thriller at Porto. Perlawanan Bola Sepak Liga Super 2024 Terus memburu ruang bagi mendominasi perlawanan Skuad Hitam Putih Sang Penyu Kini bakal berdepan Sang Saka Biru Jumaat 4 Oktober Terengganu FC bertemu PDRM FC 8.30 minit malam di saluran OK dan saluran Sukan RTM Saksikan juga secara penstreaman langsung di RTM Play. Karim Benzema and company looked up another win in the Saudi Pro League when Al Ittihad put away Al Ukhud to one earlier today. The former Real Madrid striker was first on the board for the visiting side when Moussa Diaby set him up nicely inside the box in the 50th minute. The Frenchman had his hand in the second goal as well, bringing the ball and allowing Steven Bukwijin to loft up a cross that was quickly headed in by Hussam Aoua to make it 2-0. Saleh Al Abbas came off the bench late in the match and put the home side on the board in stoppage time. The win put Al Ittihad had at the top of the table of the Russian Saudi League standings with 15 points alongside champions Al Hilal who have a game in hand. Harry Maguire's dramatic stoppage time had earned Manchester United a 3-3 draw at Porto in a roller coaster Europa League group match earlier today. Goals by Marcus Rashford and Rasmus Holyun inside 20 minutes set United on course for victory, but Pepe quickly pulled one back for the Portuguese side and Somo Omorodion equalised before half-time before striking again soon after the interval. United captain Bruno Hernandez was sent off for the second game in a row after receiving a second yellow card. But Maguire powered home a header from a corner to earn his side a point and slightly eased the pressure on his beleaguered manager, Eric Ten Hag. Ten Hag's men have now begun their Europa League campaign with two draws after being held at home by FC Twente last week to sit 21st in the 36th team table. 
Golfer seeded Coco Golf overcame a sluggish start to record a 2-6-6-2-6-2 win over Ukrainian qualifier Yulia Starodubsteva in their quarter-finals match of the China Open in Beijing. Goff saved her two break points in her opening service game of the second set. A service break propelled her ahead 3-1. After another narrow escape on her next service game, Goff lost only three more games for the rest of the quarterfinal. Goff won 78% of her first serve points and saved 10 of 13 break points while overcoming 11 double faults to dispatch Staro Dubsteva in one hour and 51 minutes. The former U.S. Open champions advanced to her second straight semi-final in Beijing and will face 15-seeded Paula Badosa of Spain, who notched a 6-1, 7-6 victory over Chinese wildcard Shua Zhang. Badosa holds a 3-2 lead over golf in the head-to-head -head competitions. However, the latter won their only meeting of the season in Rome. The Federation International the Football Association FIFA Disciplinary Committee will be asked to look into allegations of discrimination raised by the Palestinian Football Association PFA after it submitted a proposal to suspend Israel in May, with FIFA ordering an urgent legal evaluation. The ruling body said in a statement the PFA had proposed getting Israel suspended over the war in Gaza, accusing the Israeli Football Association IFA of complicity in violations of international law by the Israeli government, discrimination against Arab players and inclusion in its league of clubs located in Palestinian territory. The participation in Israeli football competitions of Israeli teams allegedly based in Palestinian territories will also be subject to an investigation. The IFA rejected the accusations and FIFA had ordered a legal evaluation. In its proposal, the PFA said it wanted FIFA to adopt appropriate sanctions against Israeli teams, including the national side and clubs. And that wraps up World Today in our job story. PM Anwar's visit to Pakistan secures 2.65 billion ringgit in trade deals. Tune in to Malaysia tonight coming up at 8.30 p.m. on TV1 and Salaran BTRTM. From river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I'm Shuhaida Arifin. Thank you for watching.